Okay, thank you. Good morning. Yeah, I must uh, maybe add that I did my PhD thesis on helioseismology with ground-based photometry. And so, actually, before switching to a space experiment, I was already working in another kind of ground-based science. Okay. Uh, my presentation. Ah, okay. So, moving. Uh, well, the key words today are uh, ground-based uh, uh, solar observations, and so ground-based versus space. Of course, uh, quite a number of you are working on space data, and as you know, the main and unique assets of space are access to short wavelengths, UV X-rays, while from the ground, of course, you are limited to visible and near infrared. And of course, from space, you can do uh, in situ measurements, access to solar particles, while of course, from the ground, you have essentially only remote sensing. Another advantage is the continuity of observations, but of course, it's dependent on the orbits. It's not true for all spacecraft. And this intermittency, day-night cycle and weather from the ground can be partly mitigated by uh, new techniques. There are no atmospheric disturbances, either abs by absorption or refraction, while, of course, from the ground, you have to cope with transparency and seeing. A lot of my talk will be involved with that. And, of course, with the spacecraft, you have centralized operations, while ground-based science is characterized by a multiplicity of independent stations. Of course, there is a cost for observing from space. And this will lead to big difference in these instruments I will show you during this talk. A space imposed limitation in weight and size of the instruments, while from the ground you can go to very large instruments. Telemetry is a bottleneck regarding the amount of data you can send, so limited image size or measuring cadence. You always face trade-offs from space while from the ground you can use very large detector and use uh, fast imaging and so you have access to time scales below one second which is almost unseen from space. From a space you have limited lifetime of spacecraft uh, while from the ground of course uh, you can do long-term monitoring giving access to time scales uh, from a few years to centuries. Uh, in space, you have instruments aging due to particle radiations, while on the ground, the aging is quite limited on hardware, and anyway, you can maintain and repair what you cannot do with spacecraft. Um, also, from mission to mission, typically you have new instruments, and so you don't cover the same wavelength range and things like that, so there is a problem of long-term standards. Uh, by uh, space observations, wh which is, on the other hand, a feature that can be provided by ground-based. Often, you end up with a unique instrument. Well, we still have SOHO, but definitely now a lot of things are relying on just SDO, while on the ground, of course, you can rely on uh, multiple instruments, which gives uh, long-term robustness and allows cross-comparisons for calibrations and things like that. Of course, high cost in space and lower costs from the ground. Not always. You will see that there are big things, big costly things on the ground. And of course, you have low development flexibility uh, in space instruments. Everything is codified while from the ground. You can upgrade the instruments continuously as new technology emerge. So, Another comparison, because of course a lot of astrophysics is done from the ground, but of course nighttime astrophysics. And so what makes solar observation different from classical astronomical observation? First, at night you have a stable stratification of the atmosphere, because there is no heat source. Why, of course, 
us observing the, 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 the sun during the day, we have to cope with a very convective atmosphere. Uh, the instrument itself is in, in a cool environment uh, at night. You have just a cool down in the beginning of the night. But uh, during the day, you have permanent heating of the instruments by the solar radiation. Also, a lot of uh, science uh, at night is done with the small, very distant objects. While here, with the sun, we have a fairly big target, half a degree, which will have a consequence on uh, different techniques. And typically, without any corrections, the seeing you have at night is around one arc second, while it's uh, more than the double for solar observations. So that was for the seeing, but uh, another big characteristic of solar observations is the high irradiance in essentially invisible and infrared. And so the contrast is between people who have a shortage of photons leading to giant telescopes, big light buckets, while uh, on, the, on the sun, at actually, you have to uh, get rid of, uh, you know, a, a torrent of photons. No thermal, st no thermal stress on the instruments, while for the sun, you have to care for heat buildup and even damage inside the instrument itself. Of course, uh, photon short uh, shortage leads to very long exposures. While for the sun, we can make very short integration, often very well below one second. And this is an asset that can be used in part to mitigate other problems faced by solar observations. Um, low signal-to-noise ratio, while for the sun, we have high signal-to-noise ratio. Another advantage. And so this mix of advantages and assets lead, led to a series of strategies to uh, beat or mitigate problems faced specifically by solar observations. And I summarized that by a series of mottos of solar obser ground-based observers. Going high, mountain stores, going cool, using water as a stabilizer, going thin, vacuum, open structures, going fast, adaptive optics, image restoration, concerning the re rejection of intense radiation, draining photons, so filters, going narrow band, draining calories, so cooling system, heat screens, and living hot. So you have hot parts in your instruments, so you're using special materials. And regarding the intermittency and dispersion of ground-based observations, the motto would be, be many. So multiplicity of stations, be together, building networks, and be linked, central portals, bringing together the information. And I would say it's the, in this last table that actually the largest shortcomings are present. So, going high. Well, most of my talk will be kind of a gallery across examples of uh, 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 instruments, uh, buildings that were designed for solar observations. Going high, well, the idea came up in the early 20th century, the first big tower at Mount Wilson, 54 meters, so more than 150 feet, uh, and um, with an aperture of 30 centimeters, and with a fairly open truss tower, actually, with an inside tower supporting independently the instrument. And it continued. You maybe have seen the Paris Meudon uh, solar tower. It looks a bit like the VRT. RTB tower here in Brussels, and on top is the Celostar with an aperture of 60 centimeters, so a design quite typical of the 60s. Now going to a 
more recent instruments. You have the Swedish solar telescope that's located in La Palma in the Canary, Canary Islands uh, at uh, more than 2,000 meters. And here the Celosta system, as you can see, is fully closed. Actually, the instrument is under vacuum. We'll come back to that later. It has an aperture of about one meter. Then Temis, which is in a way the successor of the Meudon Tower, was designed for having a polarization free instrument. So it's essentially a telescope tube with low pressure helium inside the tube. And there, the, the idea to mitigate convection because of the heat around the instrument is to isolate the inside from the outside. And so you have this round aperture that's directly connected to the front of the telescope and by a double motion you, have, you see this half hemisphere at 40 degrees and by two rotation you can keep this uh, aperture just in front of the telescope. So really avoiding any air current between the cool inside of the dome and hot outside of the dome. Uh, other towers uh, at the background, the VTT and Gregor, I will come back to that one. Two towers from, built by the Kipenor Institute in uh, Tenerife, another island. And uh, you see that before that there were already smaller towers. Um, the, those towers remain massive and uh, this is really a clever design by colleagues from the University of Utrecht, the Dutch Open Telescope, where you really bring the whole structure surrounding the telescope to the minimum, just a truss tube structure and a, a clamshell shelter in fabric so that in open situation you have a, f a free airflow all around the telescope, even under the telescope. So no eddies created by the wind. And at the same time, a minimal uh, mass of, uh, that can be heated by the sun. You just not be well uh, sensitive to vertigo when you go observing there, <laughs> climbing up the ladder there. <laughs> But uh, this leads to the fact that actually the Isania Observatory at Taylor, I don't know if anyone went there already, I, I really call it the Manhattan of solar observing because the skyline is really <laughs> a series of towers with the Taylor volcano at the back. And I cannot uh, finish the section on towers without showing the, the most beautiful one that was built back in 1922 on Telegrafenberg, uh, so near Potsdam, and was dedicated to Albert Einstein one year after he got his uh, Nobel Prize. It's only 20 meters high, but it's fully streamlined. Actually, it's a, 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 a prime example of expressionist uh, a style in architecture, and so most, uh, well, half of the visitors visiting this facility go there just for the building. They don't care about solar physics. Very nice uh, place. So, after going high, going thin. And indeed, inside those buildings, like here, the Swedish Solar Telescope, actually, the whole light path is inside a vacuum tank often with a folded light path, so secondary mirrors. But so in order to avoid convection of the air inside the tube, well, you get rid of the air. <laughs> and um, of course, that's uh, with this tower and the celosta, you can have a static vacuum vessel. But for instance, this telescope, the Gregory Vacuum Telescope, that's now out of operation because it has been superseded by the Gregor telescope, is a fully uh, 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 sealed uh, tank uh, with low pressure helium. And actually, it has a coude focus. The whole light path is also under vacuum. So empty, hollow axis of the mounts. Uh, going cool. 
Well, clearly uh, one solution are uh, places surrounded by water. So islands are of course excellent candidates and so it leads, to, it leads to the fact that the two main top quality sites in solar physics now are uh, for Europe the Canary Islands with the two sites Roque de los Muchachos on the La Palma Island which is this picture. From there by clear weather you can even see the, the Madeira Islands hundreds of kilometers away and in Zania that I showed you, the Manhattan of solar physics on Tenerife, the other island, and in Hawaii for our US colleagues, it's the Haleakala Observatory on Bowie Island in Hawaii. Those islands have a triple advantage, stabilization of uh, the air, because water keeps cool during the day, and so prevents uh, development of uh, convection above the water surface. Also, as on an island, you have no other surrounding uh, uh, landscape features. The wind, the ocean wind, is fully laminar, so no eddies due to obstacles. And if you combine that with the fact that you can find a higher, a high mountain on an island, and so typically these are all volcanoes, uh, you benefit from the altitude. But there are other solutions, lakes on the continents. And here I took, I took a series of sample uh, observatories, not all of them. Those, these are pictures from a visit I made in 2009 at the Huairu station, that's, north, uh, that's uh, 40 kilometers north of Beijing. Uh, it's a 30 meter tower, but uh, the clever aspects in the design is that you can either choose between uh, a dome surrounding the telescope, and that's used on windy conditions to avoid wind buffeting of the instruments, but otherwise you can also shift it on rails so that it's behind the instruments, which gives this uh, strange uh, special shape to the to the platform and then you have a fully open instruments without any structure that's heated by the sun. And uh, it's a vacuum telescope. Actually, there is a 60, a 30, and a 10 centimeter instruments doing spectral polarimetry of the sun. Another place um, is uh, Udaipur in India, a place I visited uh, last March. And that's a view from uh, my room, actually, where you see the observatory in the middle of the North Lake of Udaipur. The South Lake has this kind of building, not astronomical, but nice palace worth visiting. This is an artificial island. The lake is not that deep, but the only access is by boat. So if you feel like going to work with a life jacket every morning, that's the place. <laughs> <laughs> you probably know Nandita, who can, came recently here. That's her working place with essentially two main uh, two buildings. And that's the modern one for the mast telescope, which is a 60 centimeter off-axis reflector here. And actually, it's Belgian-made. It's made by Amos, the company in Liège, and is in the operation since recently, 2015. And the main feature you see, actually, the telescope is hidden behind this uh, shield that protects all the instruments from direct sunlight and heating. Uh, and it's a good example of uh, mitigation techniques to reduce the heating effects of the sun. The mirror is air-cooled, so the yellow tubes are forcing air ventilation around the primary mirror. And that's the secondary focus, where you see the harness bringing water cooling to the secondary mirror, because, of course, that's where radiation is concentrated, so that's one of the hot paths. But also the sun's shield itself, of course, protects what's behind, but if that plate becomes red-hot because of the sun, you, are, you will have turbulence. 
and uh, so there is also liquid cooling of this uh, screen. By the way, uh, you see that it's also an open clamshell structure with a fabric material. And uh, the, there is a vertical feed bringing the light from uh, the telescope with an image the rotator to this uh, 90 degree mirror that can be rotated in four directions to feed one of four uh, optical lines. Here you see it reflecting it into one of the instruments. Uh, currently they use mainly uh, monochromators, H-alpha, uh, calcium white light. Another uh, line use, uh, is uh, actually a spectroperimeter that's still in development. And the third one um, has a uh, a prototype for an image stabilization system because there is no image stabilization in the telescope on the telescope itself. Going fast. Well, now I showed you everything you can do to avoid that images are already damaged by what surrounds the telescope, what's and inside the telescope. But anyway, you will still end up with a distortion of your wave from due to the, the turbulence of the atmosphere. One strategy is try to correct it just before it reaches the detector. And this uh, implies a waveform sensor. So typically there is a beam splitter. This goes to the primary detector and this diverts part of the light beam with special optics, so you image the entrance pupil and can uh, sense the deformation of the wave front here. And this is translated into corrections. And typically, uh, the basic system is a tip and tilt system just to pre uh, compensate a sh a shifts of the solar image to more than 100 points of measure and corrections with a thin deformable mirror and of course you need a computing system to uh, absorb this information and translate that in correction in real time often at more than 1000 hertz but this is applicable typically to small fields that's also used during <coughs> for nighttime uh, uh, observations and so it's mainly uh, used for large long focus telescopes that are providing just subfields of the solar disk. For the full disk, it's uh, more, much more difficult to have an efficient correction. And so another strategy is correcting after image acquisition. And for that, the idea is to take advantage of the intermitt intermittency of turbulence in the atmosphere so that you have actually brief moments of stability, typically less than a second, every few seconds. And so the strategy is just to grab short image sequences at a very high cadence, less than a second, might be to one, up to 100 image per second. And then for all those images, you derive a measure of sharpness using gradients or contrast in the images and using uh, techniques like FFT wavelets or, or numerical filters and then you pick the images that gives you the best sharpness index in the whole set on the fly. Uh, but there is an additional difficulty due to the half degree diameter of the sun. Typically in one in exposure, you never have optimal sharpness over the whole disk. You have patches that are good, but others are less than optimal. So you need to then to pick by region where you have the clear patch and only use those ones. In addition, you have differential shifts in different parts of the solar disk. So you cannot even directly stack the images. You need to de-stretch, as it's called, and there are different local pattern matching techniques uh, that allow to do that. I won't enter in this uh, software part of, of the system because it uh, could be the topic of a whole conference. 
but the instruments are requirements to be able to implement it is high speed imager uh, typically without shutter because uh, there are so many exposure of course behind fast storage fast computers but at least Thanks to the intensity of the light we have from the sun, we can do fast imaging. So that's something that cannot be really considered and fully used for targets typically done during nighttime observing. And just a brief illustration of what you can achieve with those uh, sequences from the Dutch Open Telescope showing a close-up of solar granulation and here a close-up of a small spot showing the ever-shed effect in the penumbra. And so you don't see any transient blurring or uh, rattish motions. All that has been compensated. But you can do that also for much larger areas with the lucky imaging. And this is just one of the movies from a campaign we run last year in March processing was done by Emil Kreikam here and it's just done with average uh, seeing uh, for many hours anyway you cannot hope to have uh, the best sky conditions for a whole day and you see that uh, you can remove any stretching of the images and things like that of course it's computer intensive so it's still quite demanding to do that uh, and then another trend is going big because, well, you know that for nighttime observations, now people are contemplating a telescope with 30 meter diameters. Of course, we won't go <laughs> up to that level with, for solar observing, but still, uh, already back in the 60s, the MagMat Pierce, who that was the largest solar telescope for several decades, uh, was built at Kitt Peak and with this special uh, sanded tube because actually the Serosta sends the, sends the light along the optical axis that's par parallel to the rotation axis of the Earth. So it, just by looking you know the latitude of Kitt Peak. <laughs> but uh, now the largest uh, European a telescope is Gregor, here on top of its uh, building with the closed uh, clamshell thing. It's a, a Gregory telescope with a 1.5 meter uh, mirror. Initially, they considered using silicon carbide to face those heating problems, but uh, manufacturing proved to be impossible beyond about one meter, and so they had to switch back to zero dure low expansion glass mirrors heavier of course so more mass that uh, 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 accumulates more heat and so requires a longer time to cool down of course with such diameters to achieve high resolution you need adaptive optics and so there are, there is a system here with the parameters you see quite a number of uh, uh, correcting points which allows to achieve resolution below 0.1 arc second. Here is a cut showing the light path feeding instruments in the laboratory below the telescope. But actually the biggest telescopes, at least for a short time, is currently at Big Bear Observatory, another example of an observatory built in the middle of water, artificial island connected by an artificial uh, jetty and it hosts a 1.6 meter off-axis reflector and uh, well the uh, the inside view here show you uh, the light path uh, first concerning the dome there the choice was to have a closed dome but limiting the, the slit aperture to just a circle but it's not sealed like for Temis and then it's reflected sideways on this mirror that has a tiny hole in the middle and actually most is reflected and project 
this huge image of the solar disk on the dome, and in the middle is a tiny mirror sending just a subfield to the, the instruments uh, on the side of the primary mirror. Combined with uh, probably the most advanced adaptive optic system that includes three mirrors that actually are actuated by wave sensors that are focused, if you want, to, on different distance along the, the incoming light path. One of them several kilometers in altitude, which allows to compensate the effects of turbulence at different heights, which have different effects on on the coherence of the wavefronts and allows actually to enlarge the field on which you can uh, have a full correction, but it's still a few arc minutes, not the full solar disk. So this was showing you the buildings, the telescope, but of course behind the telescope you have focal instruments that also will have characteristics that match uh, properties of the objects we observed. Uh, and, of course, uh, the primary uh, kind of uh, uh, focal instruments that are used in solar uh, physics are narrowband monochromators. Uh, one of the type of uh, filters are fabri Perot filters, well, either etalon or interferometer, what's the difference? Well, the, the base principle of uh, the Fabri Perot is that you have two uh, mirrors, fully parallel, but very closely spaced. The spacing is of the order of the wavelength of the light you are uh, observing. Simply for the etalon, the, the mirrors are coated on the two sides of uh, glass plate, so it's air, glass, air, while for an interferometer you have two glass plates with the facing sides coated, but uh, air or sometimes a fluid with a different refraction index in between. Of course, this setup allows tuning because, of course, you can move the two plates, which you cannot do this. So both have their advantage. Uh, but so the idea is that as uh, these are semi-reflective mirrors, the light is bouncing back and forth several times during the uh, before escaping, and actually it, the, the incoming beam interferes with the one that's reflected back, and the ones that for which the wavelength is not a multiple of the spacing are uh, cancelling out and reflected back and only uh, the wavelengths that is uh, multiple of the spacing is passing through. And this gives this kind of band pass with a, succes a, succes a tomb actually of many peaks and actually and that's what the, the nice aspect uh, and, and of the Fabri Perot is that the finesse factor, which is the ratio between the spacing between the orders that are transmitted and the width of the peak, can be tuned by the reflectivity. As the reflectivity goes higher, here, the horizontal axis, the finesse factor, which is this ratio, increases. And so you can re create very narrow uh, transmissions with, that are uh, separated by uh, uh, wide blocking ranges. And this can go up to 100. In addition, even when you have this kind of uh, comb, you can further combine two Fabri Perros with slightly different cavities so that the peaks are in in pace, I would say, only one out of eight or ten, which leads to widely separated things. And, and, and then you can use an ordinary, fairly broadband filter, interferent filter, with a, a transmission like that, to isolate just one. And so you get then a unique wavelengths, and the, you can get in that way sub-angstrom uh, bandpasses. 
by the way, the filter we are using here at uh, our uh, telescope is of that type. Another uh, filter uses the properties of calcite crystals, bioreferential crystals that have these uh, special properties that uh, depending on the polarization of the light coming in, either perpendicular or parallel to an active optical axis of the crystal, the refraction index will be different. One is ordinary, so it behaves like glass, ordinary glass, and the other one is uh, different, leading, for instance, when you look through such a crystal, you see double image. But these are only natural crystals, and there you require, of course, optical purity, which makes them very rare and so very expensive. Uh, that's the structure of a Leo filter that actually combines several groups of calcite plates, half-wave plates and polarizer that help to separate the two uh, beams, ordinary, extraordinary beams, so uh, uh, separating uh, the two beams that they are retarded slightly differently by the calcite uh, elements. And again, by having different groups that have slightly different spacing, you can obtain uh, a comb with widely separated peaks that can then be isolated. All that is temperature stabilized, but the special advantage of the Leo filter is that it's tunable very easily by rotating uh, uh, the polarization filter. So you can put a motor drive or something like that. So you can do very fast scan and no thermal hysteresis. While, for instance, a Fabri Perro typically is tunable by changing temperature. But this has a time response and may involve hysteresis. So when going up and down, you don't cross the same temperature at the same time. And uh, well, these are typical images obtained with such a, a monochromators what's called filter grounds of the sun. And showing, for instance, here in H-alpha uh, solar flare. Of course, there is no, not only imaging, but spectroscopy. And of course, in solar physics, grating spectrographs are used, where you have a collimating lens feeding a grating that disperse light and is refocused. But you need an entrance slit to e so that you can really separate uh, uh, the different lines at the output. And this means that you don't we have only a one-dimensional cut across your target. And so sometimes there is a rastering system that allows you to scan, but it's a slow process, so it's not adapted for fast phenomena. But as the sun is uh, bright, it leads to very big uh, spectrographs. Here, this, this is the 60 meter tunnel, uh, where, uh, underground tunnel, where you have the Coda Canal spectrograph that allowed Evershed to detect the, the, the flow in penumbra of sunspot, the so-called Evershed effect. That's the place. And, um, and uh, so it has a 60 centimeter uh, feed uh, lens. And I think on the slit you have a 30 centimeter solar image. So everything can be big, you have enough light. Uh, by the way, the whole system is, uh, was built by Grubb and Parson, the same manufacturer as the Schmidt telescope here that we have here in the observatory. It had a, a familiar look, you know, when I was there. You know, the way things were built mechanically. Another way to build a spectrograph is the Michelson interferometer. You may probably know the base principle where you have the incoming light source and you send it through a semi-reflecting beam splitter along one uh, light path with a mirror bouncing it back and another arm and then the two interfere in the output beam there, 
and you obtain fringes. Of course, as you see, the fringes are not widely separated. The thinness compared to 10 or 100 for the Fabri Perro is only two. So typically you need another element. That's a scheme, for instance, of a space-based interferometer of that type, HMI. The red part is the interferometer and you see here the beam splitter elements that are located here. And actually there is a Leo filter that's actually a pre-filter to give to, to be able to separate the orders of the, the interferometer because they are so narrowly spaced. But this system is also used on the ground for uh, spectrographs. As you can move the mirror, you can uh, scan a large range of wavelengths. And for instance, there is a Belgian instrument at the Jungfrau York that was built by the University of Liège specifically to map at high resolution the infrared spectrum of the sun. They are especially in, uh, that's particularly useful for that uh, property. The, actually the advantage is that it's a slitless, slitless instrument. So in the case of HMI it allows imaging without having to raster with a slit. And in infrared the fact that actually you let all the light enter which gives a much better signal to noise ratio, which is more difficult to achieve in the infrared. Of course, spectroscopy gives you those diagnostics, measure radial velocities, temperature, turbulence, and things like that. Uh, what must be kept in mind here is an example of a high resolution spectrum of solar granulation. For the sun, as you have a lot of light, you can disperse a lot and so you can reach both uh, very high uh, uh, spectral resolution but at the same time doing it at high cadence. While for nighttime observations you have a shell spectrograph and things like that, high resolution, but you must integrate over minutes or hours, uh, you, are, you, you have a trade-off. So that's special to solar physics. But as you know, magnetic fields are a base elements of the sun and so measuring magnetic fields is an essential element in focal instruments and it's combined with spectrographs which leads to the fact that essentially behind the, uh, the, the big telescope you have spectropolarmeters that use the Zeeman effect and so here is a cut in an infrared line at 1.5 micron across a sunspot, that's the slit, and you see the Zeeman splitting, which is full in the infrared. That's the V Stokes parameter that shows you that both components have opposite linear polarization. And actually this allows, by using a polarization filter, to split the two components even if they are not fully separated and resolved like in this case, which allows to measure uh, uh, magnetic fields of uh, just a few tens of goes on the on the sun. Uh, the simplest uh, magnetogram uses just linear polarization and gives then just a line of sight component of the magnetic field, but using in addition circular polarization, you uh, can uh, find the orientation of the f of, uh, of the magnetic field that's called a mag vector magnetogram. The output that's known to far many of you are magnetograms of the sun. The gray means no magnetic fields and black and uh, white give the north and south magnetic priorities. Of course, here you have thousands of ghosts, but in the quiet sun you have magnetic elements of a few ghosts and this can be detected by current instruments. And then there is a special type of mm, spectroscopic instrument. These are called magneto-optical filter or in physics in general also called atomic line filters. The idea is to put in a, a closed uh, in, in, in enclosure at low pressure vapor of an alkali metal sodium or potassium typically. So this means that this can be used only at the fixed wavelengths of 
those uh, atoms. Uh, and then you can submit that to a magnetic field by surrounding the cavity by magnets. And so you create this kind of uh, 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 spectral profile relative to the rest wavelength. And um, as I mentioned, the two side components are polarized. So by a polarizer, you can switch from the uh, blue or red uh, components. These are very thin because the, essentially the, the gas inside uh, the cell is at rest. And so uh, it's much narrower than the solar line. And so if that's the solar line profile, you can uh, actually measure by a detector at the back of the cell uh, the resonantly uh, scattered light either on the blue or red wing of the line. And so by just differential photometry, so the instrument is uh, switching very quickly to beat also the, the fluctuations of transparency between the two lines and, 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 and find what's the ratio between the two. And of course, the ratio is mainly dictated by the shift of the solar line profile. And this, this gives an extremely high sensitivity in Doppler shift on the sun of centimeters per, per second, walking pace on the sun, which means that over typically the oscillations on the sun last for five minutes. It means a peak to peak amplitude of uh, 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 one, two hundred meters on the sun. So that's really high resolution. Just as a reminder, so what we can measure at the solar surface in terms of Doppler shift are the surface manifestation of uh, uh, acoustic modes that are uh, propagating inside the sun. And gravity modes are also propagating, but closer to the core, and it's still an open issue if we'll be able to uh, detect them. A few months ago, there was an announcement of detection. But uh, this is the typical um, uh, power spectrum you obtain by those measurements, and you see that there is a peak around uh, 3 millihertz five minutes of period, and when you accumulate long durations of those measurements, and there are instruments that are there already for many years, you can resolve that in a forest of peaks, each of the main peak being itself split in subcomponents that allow to diagnose uh, properties of the sun, for instance, using the fact that this is a synthetic image of one mode and showing that modes of different orders are rotating in opposite sides and if the sun itself turns you have then two uh, different frequencies for those two modes leading to those sub-splitting. Of course the raw images when you image the sun uh, measurements can be done on the whole sun so this gives the low order modes but the high mo all the modes look like this mess. You wouldn't guess that as something is oscillating in a fully harmonic way, but it's because it's the superposition of thousands of modes that the surface patterns are expressed in uh, spherical harmonics. And this nice movie shows you the patterns by scanning through all orders up to 30, I think. And of course, you can, uh, this is just the surface pattern, but in depth, those modes have also a radial uh, pattern. And by combining several modes, you can actually derive very localized information about the internal structure of the sun. Uh, and so, using imagers co coupled with the narrow band measurements, magneto-optical filters or Michelson interferometers, you can then split them both in 
special degrees that combine it, uh, separating also a function of temporal frequencies. And then you find those ridges, and you, if you look more closely, those ridges are form of individual modes. You can guess that there are more than 10,000 measured modes on the Sun. Much more than anything that could be measured on equivalent stars in, in, uh, for you know, all nighttime colleagues. And that's an illustration of uh, uh, diagnostics that are routinely done on the Sun and cannot even be imagined by our nighttime colleagues and uh, really taking advantage of the characteristic of the Sun. I showed you how you can you know, cut the Sun in narrow slices in time, space and wavelength. But uh, this is typically done by those pretty big uh, telescopes, but of, there are also, most of solar telescopes in operation now are sm much smaller telescopes, patrol telescopes, and there is really a complementarity between both. Uh, of course, large telescope gives the high spatial resolution. Uh, typically, they have sophisticated spectropolar meters giving instantaneously a lot of physical parameters, while only uh, filtergrams at a few wavelengths are provided by small telescope. But uh, with large telescope, you have only a subfield view, typically less than 10% of the solar disk, while smaller telescope gives you the whole disk. Also, you have shared observing time because there are few of those giant telescopes and so they can be only used for short runs, for limited durations, where small instruments uh, allow permanent observations. And so this leads to different applications. Small scale processes for large telescope, global processes for a, a small telescope, short duration phenomena, flare waves, uh, for large telescope, long duration phenomena from days to sort of solar rotation and the solar cycle for the small telescope. Few events, but in full detail for large telescope, all events that allows you to have global statistics, build catalogs, create maps for small telescope, which then in turn provide the context required for large telescope for planning and target selection. One characteristic of those smaller telescopes is the complete diversity, because typically they were built locally in a specific institute in very distant parts of the world at different epochs. And so this is just a small uh, gallery of examples. The PSPT, Precision Solar Photometric Telescope, a 15 centimeter telescope with the input beam, a tilt mirror to just compensate a bit the, the shift and different band passes defined by filters, two sites, Hawaii and a home. These are pictures I took here I'm next to the telescope giving the size at Mitaka Observatory, the FMT, Flam Fair Monitoring Telescope. Very nice Japanese style design built by Nikon by the way with uh, uh, parallel guns. <laughs> with, <laughs> well, uh, two telescopes are 20 centimeters, two 15. And the, the basic idea is that actually you have a, a band pass at the line center and two parallel at the wings. And so you can really have simultaneous images uh, at the center and in the wings for Doppler diagnostics instead of using one camera and quickly shifting to those uh, different positions across the band path. Uh, note the roll-off building that really clears entirely the telescope during the observation. By the way, this was during the cherry blossom period, so the rock drop was really marvelous at that time. That one some of you know, it's next door, the use it, with three, three channels. I won't go into the detail what's the, the Dome is classical, but it's the highest on the side, so they care to make it a bit higher. And, uh, but what's uh, interesting is the, this uh, table, so a big optical bench that allows to uh, 
uh, assemble different telescopes in a modular way. Other examples in Europe, Kanzler with a countryside situation. Here, Catania, which is on the roof of the university building with the Etna in the background. Fully closed uh, telescope, box-like, open truss. So, different uh, kinds of solution. That one I visited in Kodai Canal, a 20 centimeter H alpha telescope, only H alpha. It has a Leo filter built by the Nanjing Techni uh, Technical Institute. Uh, so, it allows uh, uh, line scans, but currently it's only used at line center. So, underused a bit, but a very nice instrument. And then, this is not a flying saucer. <laughs> I wanted to show you that. Actually, it was uh, uh, apparently used in a movie by Woody Allen as a backdrop. Uh, so, uh, San Fernando is specialized, so it's also a 15 centimeter class uh, instrument with the uh, now they have 1,000 by 1,000, by the, but they started with a fairly low resolution instrument, but their purpose is to measure areas in an absolute way in order to support modeling of uh, uh, solar irradiance changes. By the way, this is how this device is opening up petals like that. Interesting. <laughs> Another solution to beat things. And of course, uh, all those uh, stations, uh, of course, should work together. So, uh, this increased the value of the data. And the first one who did it, of course, are helioseismologists with the Bison network. These are the location of the different stations and the Gong network because uh, as you are monitoring those continuous oscillations, you need continuity in the data. And from the ground, you need to distribute. But typically, this was initiated by a single institute in, in spite of the multiplicity of sites. The example of Gang uh, with the different stations, and you see that it's pretty boring. It's always the same container. Actually, they built, they replicated the, the instrument exactly uh, in the same way, just like your automobile I know. <laughs> um, another uh, in, in network that existed for a long time here in blue is the US Air Force 2 network that's used for real-time space weather monitoring. Here it's used on a daily basis. The base observation, by the way, are sunspot drawings. And then there is a, a new uh, initiative by the HIDA Observatory in Japan with stations in Southern America and Northern Africa. And I think they gave up the idea of Antarctica. Too costly, too difficult logistically, but uh, also another network. But uh, to have a global view of existing synoptic station, you can go to this uh, link, which was created by my, my colleague uh, Alexei Petsov. We are co-chairing the IAU Working Group on Coordination of Synoptic Observations. And so that's a resource that's regularly updated and where you can find all stations that are currently active for solar monitoring. Uh, for synoptic uh, observations, uh, there were only informal initiatives, not really coordination of the stations, but collecting at least the data in the same place. An attempt was the global H-alpha network, but unfortunately it went offline a few weeks ago, and I still have to contact um, my colleague at the New Jersey Institute of Technology, who is also running the Big B Observatory, why they stopped with that maybe lack of funding and resources. EXO was another European attempt, giving multi-parametric browsing access to different data. One that is operational, but we made it with the observatory that includes observatories in France, Belgium, our own observations, and uh, Portugal, for instance. 
also radio data. But of course you are curious about uh, what's coming up and when evolution is going even bigger and it's about to happen as uh, DECIST, the Daniel Inoue Solar Telescope, will, uh, is almost completed and we'll see first light next year. It's a 4.2 meter telescope. As you can see, it's an off-axis system, a bit like MAST, this AMOS built system with a cooling system and a closed dome. So it's, it has some heritage from the good solar telescope at Big Bear uh, with a, also a closed dome and limited aperture and an advance for uh, improving ventilation. But of course Europe couldn't be passive and so there is another project, the EST, European Solar Telescope, also with a 4 meter clasped mirror. That's the uh, concept. It would be installed at the Tate Observatory in Tenerife, but uh, probably first light is at best uh, in 2025. There you see that there is more heritage from the DOT telescope with, with this open platform, but at least they care that you shouldn't climb up scaffolding <laughs> because of course the, this tower will be uh, more than 30 meter high given the size of the telescope. And its complement is a project called SPRING, Solar Physics Research Integrated Network Group, which would be a synoptic instrument, but still with a, a meter class aperture, but full disk. But with many uh, band passes, maybe also a spectral parameter, and the idea is to have six identical stations build around the world and using the gong sites that already exist and probably ho hosting the electronics in the existing containers but there also it's uh, uh, it will take years before it's uh, implemented but of course uh, over the past century uh, Europe and the US were at the forefront for those uh, very advanced uh, instruments, but now we have people in our on our on our heels, I would say, in uh, countries that are really emerging. And China, for instance, since last year, uh, uh, so uh, have a 1.8 meter telescope, the Chinese Large Solar Telescope, in operation. I guess it's still in commissioning phase, but expect new publication coming from this uh, telescope in China and they have a pro project with an 8 meter ring mirror telescope the giant solar telescope so they see big and India as well well more modest 2 meter telescope but with an exceptional location in the Himalaya above 4000 meter in Ladakh and that's a concept view of the tower with a, also a clam shell uh, cover. And this is led by the in Indian Institute of Astrophysics in Bangalore. And of course, networks also have to uh, progress. And there, uh, it's uh, difficult to get things started, but clearly there is a uh, whole room for improvement in synergies and standardization both in the hardware, you have seen the diversity of designs, but also simplified formats and metadata so that the data sets can be really used together. To ensure long-term continuity, as that's the important aspect that those networks are bringing, is keeping a large number of stations and keeping them autonomous because, of course, Networks like Gong, well, they were funded by the Stanford University. If Stanford decides to cut the budget, Gong entirely vanishes. So for long duration uh, science, you better actually put your eggs in different baskets. And then what is really essential is 
to develop a data merging layer that is essentially absent now and that really address the question of bringing together multi-source data with variable characteristics and this involves also corrections that are specific to ground-based no cosmic rays or, or things like that but uh, seeing transparency contrast and involving in match the convolution or restoration you have seen examples so we have the base elements allowing that and of course the ultimate goal would be to produce continuous seamless movies or maps from data from uh, all those stations. Just uh, one slide to briefly also remind you that when you think about ground-based solar science, of course it started uh, very long ago with of course visual observations for many centuries but also photography for more than 150 years and so there is a whole heap of past observations that contain a record of thousands of uh, solar events of uh, many solar cycles and a, a, a significant part of this heritage is still in a form that's not accessible to science not in digital form and so one of the challenges of the uh, coming years for ground-based is not only creating new data and, and, and expanding the, the record we have of the sun, but is also recovering those past uh, decades and centuries. And even if it takes 10 years, recovering one century, one century worth of data in 10 years is a very efficient process. You cannot do it when observing the sun now. There, the, there is no time acceleration. The factor is one. You cannot escape. Here, here you can have a time acceleration of 10. So thank you for your attention.